Welcome to Leading with Empathy and Allyship. I'm Melinda Brianna Epler, founder and CEO of Impovia, formerly Change Catalyst. I'm also the author of How to Be an Ally and your host for this show. Allyship is empathy in action. We learn what people are uniquely experiencing, we show empathy for their experience, and we take action. Want to learn more? Visit empovia.co, E-M-P-O-V-I-A dot co, to check out more of my work. Let's get started. Our guest today is Aaron Johnson, professional speaker at The Cut, which he will share more about momentarily. This episode, In this episode, we'll be talking about how we can be more anti-racist. Anti-racism is multifaceted, and part of that work includes understanding the ways that intergenerational trauma and historical power structures impact the ways that Black people are perceived and treated in our workplaces today. And we'll discuss um, particularly Black men today, we'll discuss how a Black root narrative being chronically undertouched and a lack of space to be vulnerable can lead to inequity and harm in our workplaces. And of course, we'll talk about healing and allyship as well. Welcome, Aaron. I can't wait to have this conversation together. It's an honor to be here with you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, yeah. And before we jump in, let's describe ourselves for anybody who is blind or low vision on YouTube. So I'm a white woman with long red and blonde hair. I'm wearing a black long sleeve blouse today and glasses. And in a white room with on one side is a tall, skinny bookshelf with plant t- cascading down it and some books um, from different guests who joined us. And on the other side are plants surrounding my own book, How to Be an Ally, with a bright orange cover. Mm, I am wearing a brown shirt or burgundy shirt. I have kind of a small flat top-ish slash afro hair. I have goatee with full mustache and a little bit of gray on the side. I'm, I'm blurred in the back, so it's kind of a off-white background. I have glasses and a headset. Dark skin, but not so much somewhere in the middle. Probably like mid-dark brown. I don't know how to describe my darkness, but I think there's a couple of shades typically darker than I am, but on the darker side of African heritage. Awesome. And our interpreters today, our ASL interpreters today, are Dana and Stephen from Interpreter Now. You can learn more about Interpreter Now at interpreter-now.com. Aaron, could you start by sharing a bit about your own story, where you grew up, and how you ended up getting to do the work that you do today? Uh, I would love to. Yeah. I grew up in Phelan, California, and in Southern California, it's the high desert, a very small town. And my both of my parents were pastors. My father's passed on. And... I started out mentoring young African heritage men in school. My first couple of mentees were just trying to graduate from middle school, trying to make it into high school. That was kind of our goal. I had no idea I was starting on a journey to mentor them for the next 15 years and to see them all the way into their adulthood and to prepare them to take on oppression. So for me, my goal was like, can we get you to pass a class, English, math, Mm -hmm. science, and so forth? Can we get you to graduate eighth grade? And that evolved over the years of like, can we keep you alive? Can we keep you out of these systems that are coming for you? And so for me, that mentorship program was called Turn It Up Now. And the idea behind that program was we we didn't want to call young people by the the thing they were accused of, or maybe so they did that was bad. So that these kids are bad kids, all thieves. We don't we don't we don't we don't name them by what they're accused of or what they're navigating in the distress. We started naming them by what their gifts were. So if a child had maybe had stolen and gotten caught, and that's how got them into my mentorship program, we don't call them a thief or a bad kid. We, we started saying, oh, you're an artist. So what do you do? Even though they did good, we were like, that's, that's it. That's who mm-hmm. you are. We started, mm-hmm. we started turning up all those good things. Well, what I found myself doing is in the hallways, talking to principals, probation officers, teachers. I found myself doing these little micro workshops, trying to bring equity in behalf of my mentee that was oftentimes African heritage young man. And in some cases it was successful, in other cases it was less. But I found myself kind of consulting with organizations on behalf of my students, building programs of resistance on behalf of my, my mentees, I should say. And 
I remember the moment when an organization school district invited me in to run a one day workshop. And I, I realized I had been doing that for years already. When they asked what they needed, I realized that I had not been paid for it because my focus was simply to support my mentees' survival and thrival in their, in their work. In this context, they were asking me to think about an entire district, an entire department. I was like, oh, this, it feels overwhelming on paper, but when I actually go into the room, this feels old, this feels familiar. And so in so many ways, Holistic Resistance was born out of the mentorship program. And that first job that I got and was actually paid to consult and paid to facilitate and paid to do some mediation between folks in that room. That was kind of three different jobs at the time. I didn't have clear kind of separations, but I was doing all that in that workshop. I was doing some mediation. I was doing some consulting. I was <laughs> workshopping on race. And so, but what, what it got, it planted a seed in my mind of, oh, I can do this every week. This is important. I can not only help just five students, I can influence the entire district and how they kind of implement, I can, you know, have much more impact on behalf of the same population and others as well. And so that was a birthing place of holistic resistance. And I eventually stopped mentoring and I should say stopped mentoring, absorbed it into holistic resistance with more resource and focus. And so in so many words, um, there was one university consulting situation we were in that we blurted out the phrase, we are holistically resist, we are holistically oppressed. Let us holistically resist. That was a response to one of my mentees in, in their kind of distress going, oh, I bet I'm holistically oppressed. And I remember responding just out of, you know, conversation. We have to holistically resist. And we both just froze and said, write that down, write it down, write it down. And that, mm. in, in so many ways, in that little Corolla Toyota, holistic resistance was born, <laughs> but it had several years ago before it became actual organization and started engaging the world, had a website and all the things that help us kind of sharpen what we're actually doing. That was the uh-huh. first place. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Oh, can you can you share just what do you, what do you mean by holistic resistance? What is that? And then and then if you could also share a bit about what your work is like now. Yeah, well, holistic resistance from that conversation, we started just writing about it. We realized that even in ourselves, we had this kind of separation of like march on the street that's protesting. But when I mentor someone, that's something different. And then when I eat food that has, you know, I grow food in my garden and I feed myself food, nutrition, take some some power over having access to my own food, that that was somehow separate. We realized, no, these are all dismantling oppression. So when, as I tend to my body and get access to health and, 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 and move myself across the earth to exercise and eating good food, that's part of resistance. That's, that's making me less likely to have to rely on a, on, a, on a medical system that may not be able to track my black body well. That's mm. a part of resistance. If I actually am able to go mentor someone that is resistance. If I'm a parent and I'm parenting a child, white, black, or in all the colors in between, that by giving the education to that child so they grow up with some awareness around race and dismantling, that is dismantling oppression. I would tell parents, you're shaping the world. I have a deep love for parents. I have an investment in parents. So this is marching in your living room. So we say in holistic resistance, we just make ourselves aware that as oppression will come for us, we want to be efficient in how we res- respond to it. We don't respond in pieces. I remember my mother told me, my mother used to pick cotton in Bakersfield as a young lady, uh, maybe middle school to high school. And she would talk about how her father would teach her how to pick cotton. It's before machines did it. She would pick cotton at the bottom of the, at the bottom of the stock, go up to the top. Instead of bending down, start at the bottom again, they would just go right over to the left and go straight back down. They wouldn't waste time just bending that extra effort of bending down and start at the top to going straight from the top and going straight down that efficiency. However small that movement was when you, when you picked all day, that movement of saving efficiency was going to make a difference of how they would, you know, receive enough nourishment for their family of, of money. And so I got resistance the same way is that we're picking, we're picking, we're not going to waste any movement. We're going to slap oppression one way and we're not going to record. We're going to go back the other direction. Efficiently slap both ways, resist both ways. So we're going to make sure we're looking for double ways to dismantle systems, however small it is. Holistic reason says, let's be efficient and collective. That's how oppression is coming against us. Let's respond the same way. So that's kind of the nature of holistic resistance. So it's kind of sometimes confusing for folks because we have like yeah. natural building on our website and we have singing on our website and we have consulting. Like why is natural building consulting and singing all on the website? How is that possible? And now you're talking about touch now. What is touch? Holistic mm-hmm. resistance. When we see it 
we name it, we add it to the pot, we don't separate it. So we do have, you know, obviously focuses, but we realize they all lean on each other, caring for the environment, caring for our bodies, caring for each other in touch. These are all connected pieces. So right now, I'll simply say that we are in a pretty deep investment in consulting and working with organizations, school districts, small businesses. And also, we're committed to, to me, some of the most tender, no pun intended, and most radical work of slowing down ideas like, where is tender touch for Black cis men with other Black cis men? Not that we're not tracking all the other conference of parts of a touch plan, but just tracking, oh my goodness, because of the birth of the Black brute in this country post-slavery, going into like the Jim Crow era, that there's a way in which the Black brute narrative has been under under interrogated, under dismantled over the last, say, 100 years or so. And so we're just taking on this very focused effort to bring that awareness into not just the our installation and tour, we're doing other workshops, but into organizations, school districts, corporations, where we think about how the Black brute narrative is still living, not named maybe as a Black brute, but still living in their org and how we can see it, notice it, and, and reevaluate how we hold Black bodies skillfully, and particularly Black men bodies in this context. So let's go into that a bit. Can you uh, share a bit about what the Black brute narrative is and and overall the perception of Black men's bodies in the workplace and how that impacts Black men. Yes. Yeah. The Black brute is seen every day, but it's not necessarily named. So we see it every day, but it's not necessarily named. So sometimes it's been a lot of energy just allowing people to actually know what they're looking at. And so the Black brute was a fictitious creation of a story about the black male body to justify terrorizing murder and particularly the lynching of the black body. We couldn't just go in there and grab someone that was innocent, even back post-slavery and just snatch them up and kill them. There was some kind of moral compass in America's culture. We had to create a story to do the illegal act. And then mm. and one thing that was done is as much as the mob would go into a space and, and take on some of the newspaper written word was equally responsible as spreading a fictitious mm -hmm. narrative. And oftentimes the photographs that we see are just copies of postcards and articles that were documented for that very purpose to perpetuate a fake narrative. Now, the quick definition of the Black Brute is a large, strong, Black male body that is physically strong, intellectually and emotionally not developed or complex. And so things like tears and tenderness are nowhere near them. And that they also have impulse control specifically towards white women. And the only way, the only way, the only way to the only way to control them is white men have to come and terrorize and, and to kill them. And lynching was that mob mentality story. And there's many horrific narratives here, but the Tulsa, Oklahoma massacre is a famous one that a attempted lynching turned into a massacre because of the resistance from the African American folks that were there. So there's unfortunately many parts of, of, of history has not been covered skillfully on that, but there's, there's a theme there, and what's the heartbreak is that these images and thinking are eerily still intact and have, have, have woven themselves into our modern-day culture, and that's where we are inviting folks to slow down and try and notice. So that's kind of the definition, small lineage of it, and how we're invested in the chronically undertouched project to highlight what it means to put light on it and to build community thinking around it and not just drop into shame which can happen when this topic comes up. And how does that play out in the workplace? How does that the historical per perception continues to this day? How does that seep into the workplace and the ways that we interact with one another? Well, there's many ways it shows up. But I can bring out someone that I've dealt with more recently. One of the first things I find is that when we look at African heritage men, in the workplace, and we'll, we'll use corporate as a big umbrella, and that can actually extend into other places of work. 
But I say what comes up the most is that most African heritage men that I work with or talk to have to shrink themselves to fit into some version of the black root, or they have to overcompensate and be as far away from their strong, energetic self Mm -hmm. with the risk of being accused of being a black brute. It also unfortunately smothers their ability to raise their hand when specifically white women, but also white men reach out and, and violate their boundaries, violate their bodies, and even casual, or some might say microaggression ways, which I wouldn't even qualify as a microaggression, but because that language is accessible to folks' mind, in these ways that's harder for us to raise our hand and go, this is, this feels like a violation to my body. This feels like you're tracking me differently than others. By raising my hand, there's a way that I have to do it in a certain kind of way, right? Because if I don't tend to that narrative of the Black root, I can get sucked into being accused of being overly aggressive, overly threatening. And then there's a way which I can also go on another kind of hurt here is where I can get fetishized, where the leadership or the organization can obsess fetishize my black male bodiness. But when I raise my hand and feel violated, they look at me like, what's wrong with you? And that mm-hmm. feeling of missing me could happen when the fetishization becomes normalized in the space. When it's like, I've only seen if a culture of a workplace has not done any interrogation, oftentimes the default is extractive nature from the black male body in how they approach. He's tough enough. He's fine. Why is he crying? He can't lead. He's too tender, right? These are ways mm-hmm. in which we find organizations having a hard time noticing how much they have unconscious belief structures still intact. That when he shows up tender, when leadership shows up tenderly, well, like, so it feels weird on our bodies. It's like, why? How can he? I don't know if he's a good leader because mm-hmm. that kind of tenderness in a black male body that should not ever happen. And I know this can be a male challenge, but we found it leaning even heavier on black male bodies in our experience of the amount of tender comprehensive, even though that's oftentimes asked for when it actually is shown up, is shocking to the system. And so mm-hmm. we find that those are common places in the workplace that I have wrestled with and consulted with. And just recently have been very successful in like slowing down, allowing people to allow leadership, particularly black male leadership, be tender and also respect it. And not look at the not making tenderness and weakness and mental mental collapse being somehow connected, that you can be tender and be as stable and as clear about what's happening. You just also feel the magnitude of the situation. So black male tears in the workplace are not terrifying and confusing. They're just as, I'm not just just as, the desires may be as balanced as white women tears or white male tears, but white women tears is kind of that narrative of where we find this big disparity of how much emote is available for the black male body. And, and yeah. not, just, not just tears, but just thoughtful, tender interactions can mm-hmm. be confusing for the black male body in, in a lot of standard corporate places. Yeah, there was a lot, there was a lot in what you just said. And, and the two main pieces, I think, what I heard is um, in the interactions, there can be an unauthorized touch and an, an, and an imbalance in what you can say or do about it for a Black man in the workplace. That was one piece. And then the other piece was vulnerability and that safe space to be vulnerable, that safe space to, not even a safe space, a space <laughs> to, to be able to have a wide range of, of different emotions and um, interactions in the workplace. And I, I want to just give an example for folks um, who may be thinking, well, are we talking about her in the touch side? Are we talking about harassment? Are we talking about sexual harassment? And yes, maybe. And, and yes, and, and I'll, I'll share a few examples as a white woman married to a black man, the things that we have conversations we've had have been remarkably revealing for me. And, 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 when it comes to even just sitting down in a restaurant and a server will touch, servers touch Wayne way more than they touch me, way more. And I, it's generally white women. And I think that there is a, it's some kind of a a, a signal that I'm okay with you, hmm. but there's a, I'm okay with you. But if I actually have to touch you to say that, then there's something maybe I'm not okay with yet internally, right? There's, there's a lot more to it. And also there's a power 
it's literally a power grab when you're touching somebody without permission, right? There's a power differential that's happening. And the same thing happens, not just in restaurants, not just with servers, but also when we're interacting at parties, when we're interacting at conferences, when people shake his hand and hold it, right? What are you doing right there? You're holding, you're literally holding somebody's hand and they're not allowed to take it away. That there's a power a dynamic that's happening mm-hmm. there. So just, just kind of sharing examples um, there of how it can seem small and slight, but then that could fundamentally change how somebody shows up in that space. And then in terms of the vulnerability, maybe we could go a little bit deeper into that too. And that it feels like a a paradox, right? Because you need vulnerability in order, you need to be able to be vulnerable in the workplace in order to be a more an effective leader. In order to create the trust with your colleagues, you need to share some vulnerability. Vulnerability and authenticity is correlated with trust. It's correlated with creating psychologically safe spaces for people to be innovative, to be creative, to thrive in the workplace. So um, maybe you could share a bit more about how this narrative changes the ability for Black men. And I, and I hear you're saying African heritage a lot, and, and I, I want to talk about that a little bit too, is, is what that means for you. But And could you share a bit more about how this can impact men as they go through their just daily work workplace work and also careers? I think there's a couple of things. Now, it's a couple of words I might be using throughout this this podcast and the show that I that might not be as familiar to your audience. I just want to define them really quickly and I'll go into answering your question. I oftentimes use African heritage, not because black men is a bad or not. I just find that it's a more accurate just description that in, in describing my lineage. Oftentimes it's hard to say African American when America has done a whole lot to obliterate control yeah. and extract from my body. And so to identify as African American is harder for me not a problem if you identify as African American, but I find that myself that my heritage is what I want to focus on because America is still struggling about how to actually accept my um, my presence here. And we're growing, but the increments are forward and backwards still. The piece around tenderness and the workplace. I want to also to step back a little bit and name that it doesn't start first day of work. That the shaping of the emotional profile of African heritage man starts almost before he was born. And depending on what home he comes out of, but oftentimes he, he hits into school, there's a there's a lack of, of space given as soon as they start to develop 10, 11, 12. There's a lack of space given that's heavier on Black male bodies, musically, cinematically, athletic, athletic-wise, when you're tracking I, I share this a lot by using this example because when i was a young man mike tyson and michael jordan were the two most popular black male bodies on the planet at the mm. time they were at their mm-hmm. heyday i don't know if there's anyone else that could have paralleled the amount of fame and um we even have a tv in our house and we knew who michael jordan and mike tyson were and i remember just recently someone sent me a video of interview of mike tyson sharing that he would cry before every fight right he would cry before every fight and whoever was interviewing him said, so why would you cry before every fight? And he said, because I didn't like the person that I was becoming. Now, for me, to see Iron Mike crying would have blew my mind. But like I said before, that the shaping of the corporate executive manager does not start on the first day of work. It starts from him not seeing that footage of any footage of the emotions and that's just one example, but it's one we all can grab. If you ever grew up, you're my age bracket, and you knew Michael Tyson as, in his heyday, think about how that would hit your nervous system to see him win or lose a combat and begin to weep or weep beforehand, how that would shape what's possible for you. If Iron Mike can do that, what's possible for me, mm. right, as a young Black man? We are hugely influenced at 11, 12 years old. We're trying to become. We're trying to understand and become. And so as we're deciding that, we're constantly looking for markers in our family and outside our family. So by the time we get to college, right, by the time we get to college, still the dominant presentation of black male bodies are athletes. And what we know about athletes is every time one does show tenderness or hug each other, it's almost a national story. It's, a, it's an <laughs> article. There's a discussion there. And I analyze mm-hmm. this behavior. These two brothers are hugging each other in the dugout. You know, it's the article. You find it too. I think I'm the New York Yankees or what team it was. 
but they were in the dugout, and I think his mom passed away. He found out, and he and, and one of the teammates grabs him and just holds him like a human being would, should, mm-hmm. can. Mm-hmm. And and people are like, "What's happening? Let's let's make an article about. It. Let's tell you this. Let's it's a thing. It was just a thing because it's not supposed to be actually seen because it's stepping outside of the modern day black root narrative. So by the time you show up to work or to your interview, this is already in the air. It's already potentially in yourself. And oftentimes, most organizations don't even track this. They just absorb what the kind of overculture is. You get hired in, and you start to work really hard, and you start getting leadership positions. And maybe you get a couple of you know other Black men under you, some white people under you, and it's time for you to actually have some complex conversations with people. And maybe your job is like a doctor. We have to have emotions because people are lives on the line after or before. Maybe your job is, is in a place where, where, where you're in a foster care system where you're supporting young people that have all kinds of challenges. There's a job that has that level of responsibility. And your expectation as a Black male is to be cold, mm-hmm. to be just doing your task at hand. That's the unconscious. Not No one might say, hey, don't feel. But the idea oftentimes is when you start to feel, when you start to have complex emotions, almost everyone doesn't know how to hold you. If you ever see an African heritage grown, grown man in a, in a semi-professional or professional environment begin to weep or feel, everyone kind of freezes. Mm-hmm. Like, what is happening? But oftentimes, when you have a white woman or a woman or a person that, we, that fits outside of the black boot and never begins to weep, oftentimes people won't even mind, hey, do you hug or hold me? How do we hold mm-hmm. you? Mm-hmm. It's like even reach over on the mat that I'm coming for you. I'm, they all kind of they have a, they have a model. We've seen how to reach for folks in that way, but we don't have a lot of models of how to hold. It's this black male that has some big emotions in a space. Now people have done it skillfully in the world that I've lived in here and there, but we look at the mainstream culture of what is our natural protocol. Is this just a freeze and look and say, "Oh, be all right." Hopefully, it's all right because. We have no idea if it's going to turn to rage or if it's going to turn something else because that's in the black root narrative. Him just be tender. Mm-hmm. Just mm-hmm. be tender. And sit there, no tenderness is confusing. And that's how we know it shows up. And how does it impact the, the, the workplace? Well, well, to me, I always say, well, how does it ever impact a human being? It's not be able to be a complete human being in an environment. It smothers everything. It has some impact on everything. It has impact on my ability to communicate. It impacts my ability to give feedback thoughtfully. It impacts my ability to receive feedback. If I have a person that has a complex and full emotional experience, when I give them feedback, they give me feedback. If I'm cold, I'm shut down. I am I am a task-driven, soldier-like focus. Even if I'm just like in an office that has nothing to do with being a soldier, to give that person feedback, be vulnerable in my mistakes, to ask for help, that all becomes more limited. And then the critique and the review is like, well, you can be more productive. They aren't communicating. You aren't. And that's true. The tender part is, if I'm trying to be all those things and also some other part of myself that is an emotional calorie burn mm-hmm. that I have to hold oftentimes in yeah. these business-like environments. So I'm going to breathe here, but that's one of the places where I've seen this come up again and again and again is what does it actually mean? to allow the whole human being to arrive. And most corporate offices don't even realize they're seeing 20% of their actual African heritage men in the room. Mm -hmm. So much in in what you just said. um, One of the things I want to add to it or expand is what I have have learned, that there is a a stigma in a a lot of Black communities around mental health, and mental health services and um and also physical health services and and there's there's so much within that and so many reasons why that lead back to the historical context of oppression that you've you've mentioned for sure and the systemic inequities within the medical system that say that where black people in general and especially black men are dismissed for, well, Black women are also dismissed because of their pain much more frequently than white people. And so it goes hand in hand. And the same with when we're talking about mental health services is there is a stigma within the community, Black men in particular. And there's also that 
not being able to be vulnerable in the workplace that is pushing back. So there's a cultural context and an in, inner context, and then also the structural context and the cultural yeah. context pushing outward as well and pushing inward as well. Um, so that, you know, you can't talk about mental health issues within the workplace, mental illness within the workplace without tipping that that scale, tipping that that narrative, pushing against that narrative of the black brute, as you say. And as a result, people saying, oh no, what are we, what what's going to happen to this black man that has an illness, a mental illness, right? I think that is a really <laughs> something that is we need to investigate within our workplaces, we need to investigate within our work cultures, we need to investigate within ourselves, all of us in how we navigate that mental health, physical health for black men. And then the other the other piece I want to add here is that it's such a tightrope that you're talking about where you have uh, where you have this narrative and you also have the stereotype threat that might be coming your way. You don't want to uh, the, the black man might not want to play into the stereotype of being the black brute for example and stereotype threat uh, is where people feel at risk reinforcing stereotypes about people like them, right? And so you're for for those of you listening who, who who don't know that, and so you have that stereotype threat, which may change how you interact even in a Slack message, how you interact with a colleague, whether or not you want to push back on any kind of feedback, right? Because there is that that stereotype of black men being aggressive. So I, I just, those are the things that kind of popped into my mind as you were talking about it, the little ways, the little examples of how that, or big examples of how that can impact people's lives, health, and then also workplace relationships. Correct. 100%. Yeah. And the code switching too is another one where you're, where um, somebody might feel the need to be somebody different, have change their language, change their personality, change their style and et cetera, to conform to the culture at work, the white culture at work, right? And that's that's part of the, the only the 20% that you're talking about, right? Is that not having that safe space to be your, your authentic self. And lots of research shows that when that happens, it's cognitive work that you're daily dealing with uh, in addition to your workload. And when you're not authentic in the workplace, you're not able to be authentic in the workplace, you're not getting... You're not allowing that person to fully thrive in the workplace. You're not allowing them to be fully innovative. You're not allowing them to grow. Yeah. That's true. Yes. Well, let's talk about solutions here, right? Yeah. You mentioned a bit about the relationship between white women and black men, too. Or maybe we could talk about that a bit because I do think that's part of the solution is really understanding mm -hmm. the historical context as a white woman uh, navigating and, and working to be a better ally. Things that are important to think about, the historical context being, as an example, I'm thinking about Emmett Till um, in 1955, who at the age of 14 was accused by Carolyn Bryant of offending her in a grocery store. And then he was abducted, tortured, and lynched in that kind of historical Context comes into play in the same way when Amy Cooper held power over Christian Cooper in Central Park, right? And that hurt people, people yeah. who feel less power exert power over others with less power, right? That where white women may have been struggling for power in systems designed that aren't designed for them, that are designed for white men generally. In these cases, you know, aggressively exerting power over black men, right? That perception or that historical context continues to play, to play out in the workplace. It, back, way back in um, episode eight, Michael Thomas, when we were talking about intergenerational trauma, Michael Thomas said something that still sticks with me, which is allies do your own work. Which he meant was that if you're not doing the healing of your own trauma and oppression, if you're not actively working to build an understanding of the systemic oppression and the systems we're talking about really showing up as a good ally, you may end up harming others in the way, the same way that you've been harmed, right? Or similar ways. All right. So allyship can also be harmful if, if you're th thinking of that power differential and doing it to 
it's um, coming out of pity or sympathy or rather than real genuine deep empathy and compassion for another person, right? If you're seeing it as a somebody is less than and you're helping them to get more than, right? Rather than doing it because it's the right thing and doing it in a way that you fully deeply understand what it would be helpful for that person, where they're, what they're experiencing, what they want from an ally. Right. So that's mm-hmm. one piece of it, I think, in terms of solutions is that act of allyship. And maybe could you share a bit of how you see allyship and where you see that ability for people to advocate and create change in the workplace? Totally. I think one of the first things I see often, and I've seen this happen a lot over the last several years, is they underestimate the pace of change the pace of what it means to actually interrupt oppression in their workspace, in their communities, in their families, and in themselves. I say that because you know, we live in a culture where being it's a speed. And what might it feel like to fix 100 years worth of oppression in a couple of months or a weekend march? That mm-hmm. feels very attractive. And there's mm-hmm. also a place that, and we just want to slow down, particularly white women in this context, is there's a profound opportunity because oftentimes white women are used as the pawn. The kind of even if they don't want to be used, they're oftentimes used by white men to justify a behavior, an excuse to wield power over. In this modern day era, we've seen plenty of footage of white women have, have joined the the problem of of wielding their power, their words, their fear, their terror to activate the the white male system. Either be another white male in an officer outfit or another white male in proximity to activate that. And in some cases, when it's documented, it's reversed on them. We've named a couple of those situations. But one of the things I want to mention is that what I find to be more of a challenge, and this can be white women and white people as a whole, as they build some responsibility about what it means to drop into allyship and working in dismantling oppression, is to really understand the pace. It's probably too quick if you're actually tracking CNN or ABC or any of the major media. This is way too fast to actually achieve our ultimate goal. And so I think what happens is people get really excited. They burn themselves out probably in about three months. And I say that because there's a way yeah. in which white folks and white women always have the exit button they can press. Right? They hit that button and say, now I'm going to take a break. And that break might be until the next election cycle. It might be until the next person dies solely on camera. I get to take a break. I've already given X amount of dollars and I marched for at least three days this week. I'm now going to take a break. I'm going to tend to myself. And I think it's important to tend to oneself. I'm not encouraging folks to exhaust themselves. But I'm encouraging you to understand is that what we're actually up against is not a flashpoint oppression experience. Oppression is a show up when the media is excited and goes away when they stop covering it. It is a constant pressure that needs constant resistance. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a way in which I always have asked this question is, you know, I I say, what shoes are we putting on? We're putting on sprinting shoes or marathon shoes here because this is a marathon. And what I'm sensing oftentimes is I get emails, but sometimes my emails, I almost can hear the the person breathing. (laughs) Holistic resistance. We've been invited to notice that we're racist on some level in our organization and we need help this weekend. Can you help Mm -hmm. me help us as soon as possible? They're urgent. The internet's attacking us. Whatever's happening, it's urgent. And oftentimes, including that request is, can you help us write an equity statement to put on our website so that we can let people know how invested we are Mm. in anti-racism, right? And oftentimes, they'll say, well, how long? How fast can we get the equity statement up? They will probably take about 12 months. And they kind of pause. And we'll call you back. And about 80% of the time, they don't call us back because 12 months feels like a ridiculous amount of time to write a statement. Now, the reason I say that because when I think of white women and how they're showing up, or it is how they're showing up, it's oftentimes too fast. Mm -hmm. Slow it down and really settle yourself into a lifelong pace. And we don't have a lot of examples of a lifelong pace of care is, but it, it oftentimes invites us to ask some very important questions. The people asked, I was sitting amongst a group, it was a yoga conference in San Diego, and someone pulled me aside. There's a lot of white women there, 80% white women there. And they said, Aaron, what is the worst thing that a white woman could say to you? I mean, I was like, well, the worst thing, what, what list, you know, there's a list. And I said, so, you know, before I even go into like a worst thing, I think one of the things that causes the most damage I've seen in my ecosystem of work 
is for particularly white women, oftentimes when doing this, but white men have done this as well, as they step in and go, Aaron, I got your back. Organize that black person. I got your back. I am here. You can lean on me. And a black person might be like, I'm not sure now. We got this. No, no, we got you. You can lean on me. You just, you, you just, if you need something, if you, if we, we are here, this is serious. We are marching and they're not tracking their own capacity, not tracking their own capacity. They're going too fast. The words are, and their temporary actions are, lean over lean and we will hold you and then as you start to lean back in this very tender space where there's no chanette if you fall my friend's like you know i don't have capacity i'm gonna step away and then the sisters collapse and they don't want to care of myself i don't have capacity they couldn't think of it the first time you checked in or the third time or the fourth time only as the carnage gets really intense start to collapse and sometimes the situations folks lives are on the line here it's not just mm-hmm. inconvenience People's lives are on the line here. So they're, they're, they've worked themselves into the system far enough and didn't track their own capacity. That is pace. It's not that we don't have enough books. There are some amazing books. Most white folks, and particularly white women that show up to this work, have read every single anti-racist mainstream book, have memorized the vocabulary. They've all gotten it figured out, and they have not examined equally their actual pace and capacity and to speak to it. In a real enough and safe enough terms, that the person, the group majority in this context, the African heritage person that they're reaching for, can trust their their ability to track their own capacity. Instead, we find out in mid support, in critical places, where we really need people to show up, and they're already on their anti-racism vacation. Mm-hmm. There's no mm-hmm. vacation for black bodies. We have to wake up in it. We have to rest in our stride. We have to adjust our breathing, but one thing we can't do is stop being black and it can break. That is yet to come. And so we have to understand that because of that is very helpful. I'll even say essential for a real allyship to not just read the books, please read the books, not just watch the films, watch the films. But if you do all those things and did no interrogation of your own capacity of what you actually can hold, then you're putting a big system at risk. When will you convince us to lean on you, mm-hmm. to step in with, to count on that you will step in front of? That's actually the case. No, that's actually the case. If it's not actually the case, say it now because it's helpful. I always say, mm-hmm. please give me $5 if that's what you want to do for the help this situation of some carnage. If that's actual capacity, then $5 million if you're like, oh, now I'm going to chunk and take it to court and be confused on what I was doing. I didn't realize I was copping the motion. Uh, we just had this major thing happen in the news. I just like, so, so it's sharing resources. I did. It was a capacity. Now I want to control you now that I, no, 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 wait, wait. Our capacity says, what are you actually willing to give to interrupt? We don't mind what it is. We just make sure that you actually know what it is too. Mm-hmm. And then we get marched forward with that. Unfortunately, that's something that we have seen come up again and again. So to me, it's not necessarily the worst thing one can say, but it's the worst thing one cannot examine or hasn't examined and be the worst thing that's modeled. Because words are are impactful, but words combined with actions and capacity not tracked, in some cases can be fatal to Black bodies. And that's serious to me when loss of life is on the line. So that, to me, I find is one way I think we can really all take a breath. And my thought is, when we settle into the idea of our work, we raise our hand at our own pace, and we raise and go, this is how high I can raise it on behalf of Black folks. And the media comes and says, someone just died in slow motion on the media. We don't go, now I can raise it this high. We go, you know what? I'm already raising it. I've already raised it. I know my capacity. It's not going to move because I've already raised it. It's not dependent upon. Mm-hmm. what the mainstream culture is saying. It's not dependent upon who's in office. It's not dependent upon what my friends are. It's dependent upon my deep commitment of when it's in style and out of style for mainstream culture, I am right here. That's action. When George Floyd comes and goes in this carnage, I simply have my hand raised as high as it possibly can. I've already started emptying the cup. All I'm doing is rinsing and repeating. That, for me, is a, a powerful way to show up. My pace doesn't change, depending upon who's in office. My pace doesn't change, depending on how many slow motion deaths are happening on the mainstream media. Mm-hmm. I find my pace. I'm invested in it, and I keep that pace. That, to me, is what I would hope becomes more popular in conversation 
in the white communities and particularly white women that have the potential to profoundly have huge impact on this oppressive system that's wielding its, 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 its best at a profound population. Mm, thank you for that. There's so much more here. There's so much more where we could go deeper. We, we have to end our conversation now, but I want to thank you and ask you where people can learn more. Where can people learn more about you and your work? Yeah, well, holisticresistance.com is our website. You can find a lot of our consulting workshop work. The Tinder project that I, I hold dear to my heart and we're, we're traveling the country with right now is the cutproject.org. Cutproject.org is where you can find more information about the Crown Get in Touch project, the film, what we're doing. Our best thinking is all right there too. And you can find us on Instagram as well at cut dot project on instagram so we're there to reach for folks on all those platforms awesome awesome okay everyone so slow down practice holistic resistance raise your hand and keep it raised (laughs) more episodes um, to check out if you like this one and want to continue your learning we have episode eight on understanding intergenerational trauma and its impact in the workplace with michael thomas episode 14 Moving from Structural Inequality to Human Flourishing with Dr. Angel Acosta. Episode 25, Understanding the Effects of Racism on Black Boys and Men with Dr. Kevin Simon. And episode 111, Redefining Professionalism with Pavel Martinez. All right, keep learning, keep taking action, and again, practice that holistic resistance. Thank you, Aaron. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for being part of our community. You'll find the show notes and a transcript of this episode at ally.cc. There you can also sign up for our weekly newsletter with additional tips. The show is produced by Impovia, a trusted learning and development partner offering training, coaching, and a new e-learning platform with on-demand courses focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion. You can learn more at impovia.co. That's E-M-P-O-V-I-A. Co. Allyship is empathy in action, right? So what action will you take today? <laughs>